the Orthodox Jewish community deal with the pain of dementia. I'd like to welcome you all to tonight's long awaited event on dealing with the complexities of dementia care. We are honored to have David Traxel as our featured speaker and are sure you will come away with lots of valuable information. David will be taking questions after his presentation. I thank you to those of you who have sent in your questions in advance. You still can submit questions through the chat box. So if any of you have anything that you'd like David to address after his presentation, please type the question into the chat box and we will give it to David to address. Also, after the event, we will be raffling off 10 copies of one of David's books and my favorite book, a Dignified Life, The Best Friend's Approach to Alzheimer's Disease. To enter the raffle, please send your name and contact information to raffletroxel at gmail.com. That's R-A-F-F-L-E-T-R-O-X-E-L at gmail.com. If at any time in the future you have any questions or would like to discuss an issue, one-on-one, -on -one, I can always be reached at C. Curran's office at 718-534-1008, or you can email me at Leah, that's L-E-A-H, at zcaron, Z-I-C-H-A-R-O-N dot org. That's L-E-A-H at Z-I-C-H-A-R-O-N dot org. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I'd like to thank the Jewish Home of Free Old New Jersey for sponsoring tonight's event. I'm gonna give the mic over to Sarah Cohn of the Jewish Home, but before I do so, I'd like to say a few words about their amazing memory care unit. When the Jewish Home approached Sikaron about their plans to open a real memory care unit, I must admit I was extremely skeptical I've always viewed the dementia village in the Netherlands where people with dementia are free to go about what they presume is their daily routine and always wondered why no one on the East Coast of the United States could even attempt to just duplicate a little bit of that. And then I went to see the Jewish Homes Memory Care Unit. When you enter, the Jewish Homes Unit, which by the way, the whole building is beautiful. It really does not look like a nursing home. You do not see bedbound patients or drooling men or women nodding off in their wheelchairs. The atmosphere is alive, whether it's music and dancing, crafts, people shopping with authentic looking cash in their personal boutique women caring for their lifelike baby dolls in the nursery, or patients walking around in the locked-in garden, the residents in the Jewish home are truly happy. I've observed the staff meeting with families to find out what each individual patient's likes and dislikes are. I've had staff members reach out for advice on how to deal with complicated issues. I must tell you, I am extremely impressed with the facility and with their staff. I'd like to thank Norman Rokeach, Sarah Cohn, and Yehuda May of the Jewish Home and Freehold for making tonight's event a reality. Sarah. Good evening, everybody. It's an honor to finally have pull this off and have everybody here, although it's virtually. We had intended to do this over a year ago in person, um, but due to COVID and circumstances, we have to do it virtually and hopefully we'll be able to repeat it again in person soon. Um, this evening, uh, we are very proud to sponsor this event. Um, working with Leia and Zikaron has been an eye-opener, has been an honor, 
Um, it's a service. I'm going to talk a little bit about what Leia does for the community. Um, it's an organization that so many people don't even know about. I think I stumbled upon her office in Brooklyn by mistake. I didn't even know it existed. Um, this organization existed. I personally went through two grandmothers that had um, Alzheimer's and passed away from it. And we didn't have that support system that so many of you are so fortunate to have. Um, so working hand in hand with Leia at the Jewish home has really been um, an added layer uh, to our extensive program that we have. So a lot of people, when they hear nursing home, memory care, they envision a dark, drab um, nursing home, patients sitting at nurses' stations, not motivated, um, not cared for, left in bed, um, dirty, unkempt, smelly facility. I hear a lot of these things from families that call. Coming into the Jewish home, you feel like you're walking into a five-star resort. Absolutely beautiful facility. Um, and our memory care is unique. It's small. It's only 30 beds. It's on its own floor. Um, it has its own private courtyard. You can find our residents outside dancing, singing, live entertainment. Every day that it's sunny, bright and early in the morning, they're outside doing activities. It's a lively um, atmosphere. That's what you feel when you walk in. They were, I walked in earlier today. They were horse racing on the table. Um, we, we keep them busy. We keep them active. Um, it, it resembles more of an assisted living setup where there's a living room. There's a dining room. Um, there's a shower room, or we like to call it a spa. It does look like a spa. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit of what the facility looks like. So you kind of have an idea. We do offer tours. Um, we are now able to bring you in to actually see the facility. But what I wanted to tell you is that the decision-making process is very hard. Um, everybody is um, that has someone dear to them, whether you're a caregiver, a spouse, a child, a family member, um, you're going through a hard time. I've been there. I can say it's not easy and it's not pretty. Um, we're here to help you. And if I can't help you or it's not the right setting, I can advise you or send you to Leia. We work hand in hand. She calls me, I call her. We really are here to help you. Um, and if you, you're in New York and we're in New Jersey and it's a question about Medicaid and how to go about it, there's so much we can do to advise you. And I've helped many families, even if they're not ready for it. I was able to set them up with systems in place for community-based um, activities. So really, we, we do offer a short-term respite. So say you do have a wedding or a graduation, or you want to get away to the country for a Shabbos and you just need a break, um, we offer respite services. We have um, many, many families bringing their loved ones in just so they can go to Simcha on the weekend so that they can get away and just get a breather. It gets to be a lot. And sometimes, and, and Leia has had many families call her and they call me and they go back and forth. Should we bring them to the wedding? We're going to talk more about that. But um, at the end of the day, we're a resource and we're here to help you. You're not in this alone. You just have to know that we care. We know what you're going through. And Whatever it is we can do, um, you know, give us a call, whether it's Leia, whether it's myself. I'm going to put my information, my cell phone number, my email address, the facilities website, um, and all that on the chat. Um, and I'd be happy to help you if you have any questions. Um, it does, you know, it, with the holidays coming up, I have two families already that are bringing their family members to us for the holidays because they have to go away. So um, absolutely reach out to me. I'd be happy to walk you through the process and see if there's, you know, best case scenario. What can we do if there's an emergency? Um, you know, definitely I understand the reluctance. Um, we are 20 minutes north of Lakewood. So Freehold is on the way towards New York. It's 20 minutes north of Lakewood. It's really easy to get to. It's in a serene farm-like setting, uh, beautiful grounds. Um, so again, we're gonna turn it over so you can see a little bit of a video of what it looks like, and then we're gonna take it back to Leia. Thank you so much for this opportunity and enjoy.
I apologize, there is no sound. Um, it's just music and we're not able to find the sound right now. Here you go. I just want to add in a little bit more. I did not mention we are OU certified, Paul of Israel. Um, we do have a mashkiach in our facility seven days a week, and there is a rabbi there seven days a week as well. The synagogue or shul you saw is not open right now to services. Uh, once the state does approve us, we will be open hopefully in time for Rosh Hashanah. So um, again, that was just a little glimpse of what it looks like. I'd be happy to show you in person around. If you have any questions, reach out to me. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Dementia is a disease different than any other. There is no cure. There is no set pattern. And one never knows what the next moment may bring. For those of you caring for a loved one suffering from dementia, each day is a roller coaster of emotions, behaviors, and memories. Dementia is not just about memory loss. It's about odd behavioral patterns. It's about dealing with anxiety, antagonism, anger, delusions, hallucinations, bad decision-making, and so much more. The person suffering from this devastating disease cannot change. The, partic the particular area where the damage on the brain set in will directly impact whatever communication or behavioral deficits that person exhibits. So it's up to you, the caregiver, to learn how to best navigate the complexities of living with dementia. With a proper toolkit, you can avoid most confrontations and learn how to communicate so that you won't feel at a loss and your loved one will retain his or her dignity. Tonight, we are honored to have with us one of the individuals who have changed the way people with dementia are perceived and treated. David Troxell, together with his partner, Virginia Bell, has co-authored six influential books, including the famous, The Best Friends Approach to Alzheimer's Disease, and written numerous articles relating to dementia care. David and Virginia created a program geared to giving people suffering from, from dementia a dignified life. His areas of expertise include best care practices for persons with dementia, caregiver support, staff training, and long-term care program development. David himself has also been a family caregiver, supporting his mother, Dorothy, until she passed away from Alzheimer's disease. Last year, we had arranged to fly David in from the West Coast to do a two-day presentation, one in New York and one in New Jersey. And then COVID canceled this and all other events. We are fortunate to have David present directly from California, giving people in all parts of the world an opportunity part to participate. It is my pleasure to introduce David Troxell. Well, thank you so much, Leah. It's great to be with you all. I'm, I'm so sorry that I can't be with you in person. Of course, that would have been just so terrific. But perhaps next year we can work something out or a future visit. I actually lived in New Jersey for four years. So I, I've had a chance where I went to graduate school at Rutgers Medical School. 
Uh, really enjoyed my time there and so have many dear friends in the Northeast. So it's just terrific to be with you all. I'm going to jump right in because I know the hour is uh, late for many of you and we're going to uh, see if I can share my screen and get started here. Again, thank you all for being with me today. And I'm so pleased not only to address uh, some folks in, uh, in the new Northeast, but also I think in Canada, perhaps even internationally. And again, thank you very much to our sponsors today. I so appreciate learning about Zikaron and your incredible work that you're doing there to support uh, caregivers in the Orthodox community. And of course, thank you to my friends at the Jewish Home for your work and for sponsoring this as well. Uh, I think I've been more than introduced. And I, by the way, a new career high, I have to say, Leah, is having an email with the word raffle in it. So I have a Troxel raffle or raffle Troxel, which I think is <laughs> kind of great. So I'm, I'm gonna keep that one if you'll give it to me and you know, I can do regular <laughs> contests. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but yes, thank you very much. I've, I've had a chance to work in a variety of community and university settings and been honored to be part of this incredible field for the last 30 years or more, hard to believe. So today I'll, I'll offer an update on Alzheimer's disease and dementia care, uh, discuss very briefly, but I think it's such an interest, the current drug discovery pipeline. And yes, uh, I already saw one question in the chat box about the new uh, aducanumab drug that's uh, had a lot of controversy. I'll comment on that. And then I'm going to primarily focus on successful caregiving strategies, some do's and don'ts, and of course, activities that support quality of life. Now, it's not formally part of my presentation, but you know, just as there is a great diversity within your community from everything uh, Leah has told me and I've read, there's also, I think, a great diversity in people with Alzheimer's disease and these other dementias. I sometimes like to say that if you've met one person with Alzheimer's, you, you've really met one person with Alzheimer's. Everyone seems a bit different and unique. Uh, my own mother lived in memory care for three years before she passed away in 2012, and uh, probably in 2008. And um, you know, even within her 20-person memory care neighborhood, uh, some people have been diagnosed by the same neurologist, the same diagnosis. Some people kind of race through this illness in two years. Some people live for six or seven. Uh, some people actually maintain pretty good language, a decent memory. Uh, others, uh, I think an elephant could have walked into the room and they wouldn't have known what had happened five minutes later. <clears throat> so that I think in some ways is a blessing. It's a challenge because even in your q and I'm not gonna be able to tell you exactly what will work. But uh, I think the, the blessing of this individuality is we can focus on people's strengths, be creative. And I hope I can give you all some practical tools that will work with your, your family members. And I know your community is so embracing family, which I, I so appreciate. Uh, and you know, I, I just wanted to touch base. I'm sure some of you may have read this, but the Carters recently celebrated their 75th wedding anniversary. Now that's an achievement. Uh, and uh, you know, Rosalind Carter, some of you may know, had devoted her post White House uh, first lady work and, and post presidential work, so to speak, uh, devoted to caregivers, where she has an institute in Atlanta. And I love this quote there are only four kinds of people in the world those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers those who will be caregivers and those who will need a caregiver. Uh, so, you know, just again, a reminder that this is such a huge challenge, public health issue, caregiving. Uh, I live in Sacramento. I, I live in an older neighborhood. I actually inherited my mom and dad's house. We're very neighborly throughout this whole pandemic, as I know many of your neighbors and community is. And honestly, every other house is involved in some kind of caregiving situation right now with a mother-in-law, a mother, a father, a sister, uh, it is extraordinary what's happened in this world. Now, some of you who may be interested in finances have probably heard of a magazine called Barron's Magazine. And, and Barron's is a, a weekly uh, Dow Jones newsletter about the stock market. And look what was in one of their issues just a few months ago, the other pandemic about Alzheimer's disease and these other dementias. And, and really until COVID hit Alzheimer's uh, in many ways, I think it's been considered one of the most expensive illnesses, if not the most expensive illness in the US, hard to believe because of its longevity. But Alzheimer's disease and these other dementias represent the sixth leading cause of death in the US, the only one of the top 10 diseases that don't truly have an effective cure or impactful treatment. Again, I'll talk about the new meds pretty soon. And it is costly. Any of you who've been caregivers know that it can be very expensive uh, to uh, help a person with dementia as a caregiver, either with assisted living, with in-home care, 
or even just thinking about how many of us maybe have had to leave employment to be supportive of a family member. Now, I always like to define my language because probably the number one question I've asked is what is the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease? So let me see if I can give you a, a kind of a, a sweet example here uh, that might uh, pang, cause some hunger pangs pretty soon. But dementia is a condition characterized by a progressive or persistent loss of intellectual functioning, especially with impairment of memory, and abstract thinking, and often with personality change resulting from organic disease of the brain. Now, maybe a simpler way of phrasing this is an umbrella term for lots of things that can cause this confusion and memory loss, most commonly in older people. Now, Alzheimer's disease is one of these dementias, along with some common ones such as Lewy body, vascular, frontotemporal, and others. Now, my example here, which I hope will soon make sense, is think about the word soup. There were dozens and dozens of soups, right? You know, chicken noodle, uh, matzo ball soup, right? Uh, lentil soup, green pea soup. There's many, many kinds of soup. Every matzo ball soup is a soup, but not every soup is matzo ball soup, right? So again, if you go to a restaurant and you say to the waiter, you know, I feel like some soup today, what is the soup of the day? They will tell you. So again, stretching this analogy perhaps a bit thin, if your doctor says mother has dementia, that's kind of like the waiter saying we have soup. It's, it's just too amorphous, too vague. You wanna know what is the soup of the day, what kind of dementia mother has. So I hope that explains it. Every Alzheimer's disease is a dementia, but not every dementia is Alzheimer's disease. Again, we wanna nail it down and today you can, uh, we, we really believe that these excellent neurologists, these memory disorder clinics, even though there's not yet a definitive test for Alzheimer's, we, we kind of know it when we see it, we know how these other uh, dimensions behave, and you can be very confident your, that your physician can actually diagnose uh, one of the dimensions these days to really know what's happening. And of course, again, why is this a, uh, another public health crisis? Well, our numbers are growing. Uh, if we don't find an effective way to prevent this disease or get a cure, the numbers may triple by 2050. And of course, um, it's been such a stunning thing to say, but until this recent FDA approval of this new drug, a trade name Aduhelm, uh, it had been almost 20 years since we've had a new FDA approved drug for Alzheimer's disease. And I have to tell you personally, uh, that kind of breaks my heart. And I think professionally and personally, I'd say it's, it's kind of a debacle, really. It's, it's shocking and stunning that we've had so many failures. Many major pharmaceutical companies have left the field of Alzheimer's disease, but there is some good thing. There are some good things happening that I'll talk about in a minute. And again, I'll tell you a bit more about Adju, Aduhelm momentarily too. And what is the good news? I've maybe painted a bit of a I have a dark picture. I, I'm a reader and I've always loved Charles Dickens' book, A Tale of Two Cities. And you know, the opening sentence, that very famous sentence, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And I think that really applies to Alzheimer's disease. We're so happy that stigma has in many ways fallen away. Uh, we know that one in three families are impacted by Alzheimer's. But what's so great is that Alzheimer's disease research funding is tremendously up thanks to our friends at the Alzheimer's Association. I think now we're spending a little bit over three billion dollars a year in research. Now some of you may think oh that's a lot of money but it really isn't when we look at the cost of this disease and it was woefully underfunded for so many years. And, and I will say again for those of you who maybe you get a little depressed now and then when we think about politics, I will say that Alzheimer's disease research funding has been one of the few areas of bipartisanship the last 10 or 15 years. So that is certainly very encouraging that our, our politicians can get together and agree on something. Hopefully they'll come up with more things to agree on in the future. What is also the good news is, you know, years ago, we didn't really believe that you could prevent Alzheimer's or delay the onset. Well, more and more, we are seeing promising evidence that there are things we can do that might help our risk factors related to Alzheimer's disease. There may be lifestyle changes we can make that are brain healthy and perhaps delay the onset of Alzheimer's, even if you have a genetic predis predisposition to this disease. So here's just a few things. Diet, uh, a diet you know, rich in seafood, olive oil, that famed Mediterranean diet can be very, very helpful, uh, but eating a heart-friendly diet. Exercise, probably the number one thing out there is exercise. People who exercise regularly may get Alzheimer's disease later in life than people who don't. 
And if you have Alzheimer's and you stay physically active, you may, it may slow it down a bit, we hope. Social engagement. This, this really fascinates me, but there have been research studies that say that people who are kind of loners, people who don't have friends, maybe who aren't married or partnered, they might get Alzheimer's at a higher rate than people who are the social people who belong to a faith community, who have friends, who are active in their community. I like to say the brain loves company, the brain loves company, and kudos to, to your wonderful community and the Orthodox community. Uh, everything I've, I've learned uh, about your community is that family is so important, that being with people is so important, being social, uh, sharing this, this faith together, uh, engaged in ritual, that is all very good for the brain. So there you go. Lifelong learning, again, that use it or lose it phrase, learning new skills every decade of our life, getting good sleep and controlling blood sugar. Uh, there's some actually some very interesting work being done about people who have diabetes and they're not watching or controlling their diabetes. Uh, that can be a, a real challenge. So, so we want to watch that blood sugar. And again, all of these things are good for our cognition as well. Uh, just a tiny bit more about medications and drugs, because I know it's always of great interest, but there's an annual study done by a colleague and friend of mine, Jeff Cummings, who's at Cleveland Clinic in Las Vegas now. He and his colleagues do an annual study of sort of the research pipeline, so to speak. And in 2020, he writes that there were 121 unique therapies in clinical trials for Alzheimer's. About a third of them were in phase three, that final step before potential approval. The majority are targeting disease onset or progression, but a number of them are actually named at doing it, or aimed, pardon me, at doing a better job around some of the behavioral symptoms of dementia that Leah talked about. Uh, I'll mention it briefly, but you know, these psychiatric medicines that often we turn to, or some people turn to for dementia, don't work very well. These psychotropic medications, and they have a lot of side effects. So we're trying to do a better job in this research study. There's a much greater diversity of approaches looking beyond past theories to new areas of interest. And I was very encouraged. I, I, I have to fact check this to know how the pandemic impacted it, because I think this article came out pre-pandemic or at least um, maybe it reflected some old data here, but the current studies in 2019 at least had over 30,000 participants, which I think is great, volunteers who are trying to, to do something for a greater good. Okay, I feel like I buried the lead, as they say in journalism. Let me talk about Aduhelm, Aducanumab. Uh, some of you I'm sure have followed this drug and uh, I have to say it has been quite a drama. It has been really, a kind of shocking set of circumstances surrounding this approval process. And every day there's some new news about it. Bottom line is aducanumab by Biogen is one of these drugs that attacks uh, the amyloid plaques in our brain. And the drug study was underway when Biogen announced a while back that the drug had failed, that it was not going to be successful. And they basically withdrew the, the drug from the market. But later they crunched the numbers a bit better and they found some subgroups where the medication perhaps is working in these early stage patients, right? So uh, the drug has had a checkered history, uh, an FDA, an FDA outside advisory board voted, I believe almost unanimously not to approve the medication, but then lo and behold, the FDA surprised everybody and approved it. Uh, there's more to come on this medication, but suffice to say, what I'd, I'd like to share with you is that after some give and take up and down, originally they approved it for all stages of Alzheimer's, this medication only works. There's just no evidence that says it works for middle and late stage people. It only works for people with mild cognitive impairment, early Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the, the rub is it's an infusion. You have to go, I think, uh, once a month for uh, a number of months, you have to have a MRI scan to look because of some of the potential side effects that are going on. Uh, so it can be a very, very tough drug to take with potentially some significant um, side, side effects. So basically a one hour IV medication uh, given by injection uh, for uh, every four weeks, three MRIs, it's a challenge. So I would simply say to you this, that this is not the answer, this new medication. I'm not a physician, but uh, I'm reflecting a lot of my friends in the research and physician community. Uh, it may help some people in the earliest stages of dementia, uh, mild cognitive impairment. But I think the great news about this approval is it's sort of shaken the tree. And so many other drug companies now are encouraged that they can get a drug approved. 
but I think we're going to see better and better drugs and more medications that will help. Currently, there are four medicines that are modest in what they do. Aricept, Exelon, and Razodine are what we call cholinesterase inhibitors that give those brain a bit of a boost. Namenda is an old drug that often is combined with those first three. These four medicines probably help a little bit to keep someone going at, at a certain level. The nice news, a very mild side effect profile. So again, Adjuhelm, only for a small subset of people, talk to your doctor about it. I haven't mentioned $56,000 a year with a potential eight to $10,000 copay. So let's stay tuned and hope something better comes down the road. Okay, now I'm gonna now um, sort of transition and, and talk a bit about how we support quality of life. And I'm sure this is what you've all been waiting for here. How do I help my mother, my father, my brother, my sister, my grandparents? How do I uh, address this diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease? Well, number one is I want you to think about keeping the person as healthy as possible. It seems to me that people with dementia, again, this broad group of people with cognitive issues, including Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia, they're simply less resilient than the rest of us. And if they get sick, it can really knock them down. It can trigger dementia-related behavior. It can definitely reduce quality of life. So I love this slide here from a colleague of mine at the University of California, Davis, here in Sacramento. Uh, Mike McLeod, who's a very distinguished, I think recently retired geriatrician, he says Alzheimer's disease doesn't travel alone. I think it's a, a beautiful concept that many people with dementia, they have certain conditions that are actually treatable, but if we miss them and they go untreated, everything makes matters worse. And on the right is this list, pain, depression, malnutrition, medication challenges, too much, too little, blood sugar, sleep, stroke, alcohol, and of course this last one so profound during the pandemic, loneliness and isolation, okay? And I wanna say a, a couple words about the first two, pain, okay? Let's say your grandmother is really exhibiting challenging behavior, okay? Uh, you could think that it's perhaps directly related to Alzheimer's, but it also could be related to pain. Because you see, if I have a toothache, Let's say tomorrow I wake up and one of my teeth is, is just blowing up on me and I can tell I have an infection or something. You see, I can call my dentist and say, help, I really need to get into your office, right? But a person with dementia, they may experience that tooth pain and not be able to connect the dots. They may not be able to say to their husband, you know, honey, I, I'm having terrible pain, I need to go to the dentist. Instead, they may just simply live with that pain. And how are any of us when we're in pain? We withdraw from society, we don't eat, we get grumpy. I suppose you could potentially strike out at somebody if, if they were you know, coming too close to you, if you were really in pain. So watch for pain. Uh, uh, maybe we, maybe uh, Yehuda could put it in the, uh, in the chat room, but there's actually a, a pain scale called pain AD uh, that's in the public domain, very easy to use. You can Google pain and then capital A, capital D. Depression. 40% uh, of people with dementia, according to the Alzheimer's Association, will experience depression during the course of their illness. And we don't totally know why, but there's just a long, interesting history between depression and Alzheimer's. There, there's a study that I, got, I came across a while back, dating back to 1952, that said that people with long histories of clinical depression are, are more prone to cognitive illness. So watch for depression. Uh, you can treat depression if you suspect it uh, with, um, with uh, time outdoors, with activity, with engagement, with positive language of music. You can also treat it with medication and the antidepressant medications aren't too bad in elders. So again, watch out for pain and depression. One of the things I don't have a slide on, but I just love this idea again from my mother's neurologist, Dr. Bob Harbaugh. He said to me once in Santa Barbara, you know, David, Alzheimer's disease and these other dementias, they are like a slow and lazy river. They're a slow and lazy river. So if your mother or father are doing pretty well and then boom, one day they aren't, it doesn't mean that they've somehow gone into stage 7D of Alzheimer's last night. It means they're ill, you know, urinary tract infections, other kinds of things like that can come and, and, and be involved here. Now, I'm sure all of you have this next uh, slide in, in, in good shape, but I do like to just kind of go back to some very basics that remember that if you've had a family member with Alzheimer's disease, they're gradually going to lose capacity. So by all means, get your legal and financial affairs in order. 
You want to, again, keep the person as healthy as possible. Learn all you can about effective caregiving. There is a right way and a wrong way to be a caregiver. And thank you all for participating in this educational class. And then learn some strategies to improve quality of life. And then this last bullet, I think is very important because even though I know that family is so important and you're probably sometimes reluctant to, to involve other people and, and you know, use an adult day center or get an in-home worker or consider residential care, you know, sometimes that, that is something you have to consider. So I always say to families, don't wait and wait and wait to use services. Uh, you know, make a game plan because you don't want to have to decide something in an emergency. You know, if you're the primary caregiver and you fall and break your ankle and you can't give care anymore, you, you want to at least have a game plan organized. So I say make a kind of post-COVID care plan to see if there are community-based public or private services that can help you as a caregiver. Okay. So um, now we're going to just kind of go into David Troxell's caregiver toolkit and give you some examples of some techniques and ideas that can help with uh, dementia care. And then I think I have a feeling based on even some notes I've already taken that there'll be a good hearty discussion. And uh, as, I, as I think Leah mentioned, we're going to go about 90 minutes on this webinar. Some of you have to sign off earlier. That's fine. But the last 20 or 30 minutes, probably 30 minutes, I, I promise to devote that to you and your Q&A. So without this good medicine, we know that Aduhelm is, is not the answer. Hopefully there'll be some new ones. Uh, evidence supports the value of engagement, exercise, music, art, lifelong learning, and religious and spiritual connectedness. They build self-esteem even as memory declines and certainly supports your wellness as a caregiver, okay? Now, I'm not talking heavily about this this evening, but as Leah mentioned, I'm known for writing several books in the field with my, my dear colleague, Virginia Bell, who just turned 99 years old in Lexington, Kentucky. She was running 10Ks into her 90s. She still works, she's still active, she's still doing great. And we're actually writing a new book together as, as I speak. So we wrote a book about 25 years ago called The Best Friends Approach to Alzheimer's Care. And you know, at that time when we wrote the book, there was a lot of negativity, a lot of uh, stigma and shame. Uh, you'd read a book and it was almost like someone had died the minute they'd gotten the diagnosis. And we were uncomfortable with that. You know, we, we know that there are so many losses with dementia, but we wanted to somehow say, well, you know, how can we do our best to bring out the best in our family member? And how can we maybe at the end of this emotionally, physically and financially stressful experience, is there a way where we can say, you know, I did a pretty good job. I'm proud of what I did instead of being just, you know, embittered and exhausted, although obviously exhaustion comes to the territory. So we basically said that, you know, maybe what a person with dementia needs is a friend, a best friend, somebody who would employ empathy. Uh, so we know it's the disease, not the person. We're, we're forgiving. Uh, we accept the diagnosis because it's so tough, isn't it, to accept it? You know, if I had a broken arm, you could see the broken arm, but we you know, we can see the cast, but when you have a broken brain, you can't see that. And so sometimes we expect too much or too little, but being a best friend means we empathize. You know, if I'm having coffee with a friend and he says to me, you know, David, I'm sorry today. I'm not at my best. I have a terrible migraine. Well, you see, I'm going to be forgiving if he's sort of snippy or impatient with me or gets a bit angry because I know he's in pain. So empathy is part of being a best friend knowing each other well. You know, friends know each other very well. I, I know what friends I can throw a surprise party for and what friends would never speak to me again if I threw a surprise party for them. So I want you to think about how you can celebrate your family member's life story and particularly be aware that, you know, if you move a family member to the Jewish home or have a caregiver come in, you want to make sure they know a lot about the person so they can better relate to them. We have to kind of be their biographer because they're forgetting so much of their own story. Communication. Friends communicate. We, we phone each other, we text, we email. And so the best friends approach is about learning ways to communicate better. Being encouraging, being supportive. The, the, the life of a person living with dementia is a tough one. They, they've had to maybe give up a, a job or a car or give up control of their money. Um, you know, they, they sometimes often know they're, they're not who they once were and they're worried about, you know, might they um, you know, not follow a tradition that's important to them, even related to their religion. Might they embarrass their family? There's so many different things that a person with dementia must carry with them. So we want to offer encouragement, support, like we would any of our friends. Be creative in our problem solving. And of course, friends do things together. 
And we, we talk in our books about something we call caregiving knack, K-N-A-C-K. And knack is the art of doing difficult things with ease. So let's see how that all works, okay? So again, life story work. Now, again, you certainly know, you know, I know a lot about my mother. I, I don't need to write my own list per se, but I want to just encourage you to take a few minutes, maybe think about writing a little top 10 list of your family members' routines, personal preferences, and achievements. This little top 10 list can, again, be very handy for any outside caregiver. Let's say your mother has to go to the emergency room. I'd like the doctor to be able to know that maybe she goes by the nickname Tony, even if her name is Antoinette, okay? So write down their professions, their hobbies, their talents. Have they ever won an award, any special achievement? What are they most proud of? Food favorites, any special foods that are particularly meaningful, favorite stories, life milestones. I remember one time um, there was such a delightful man I met who lived in Brooklyn, and he was, I think, 80 when I got to know him. But he remembered running away from home when he was like 10 or 11 years old. And he ran, he walked across the Brooklyn Bridge on his own. You know, today that would be a nightmare, but back then it was quite an adventure. And he loved it when we cued him about this great adventure. And he would tell the whole story all over again. Again, daily rituals, you know, what do they drink tea or coffee in the morning? And of course, uh, what, what might be important to them with their religion and spirituality. So again, we want to know and use this life story. So again, let's say you do write this out and you want to kind of be a bit more intentional. Well, again, when your mother's having a bad moment, when she wants to leave the house, your father's mixed up about the, the day of Sabbath or something, you can take a minute and, and dive into this life story. Encourage mother to talk about her childhood, if it was a happy one, or to break down the ingredients of a favorite recipe. Talk to your father about his career. Ask for life advice. Prepare a favorite snack or beverage. Play some favorite music. Uh, I'll talk about music in a moment, share us, uh, maybe a favorite spiritual reading or ritual, and offer praise to the person about, you know, dad, you raised four boys, you're really our hero, you did an amazing job. All of this builds self-esteem. Now, to tell you how simple this is, I, I always love, I, I had a beloved, wonderful mother, Dorothy, uh, who was actually born in uh, Vancouver, lived in Hong Kong, in Montreal, Germany, France, D.C., my mother was a, a wonderful woman. She was Canadian. And just to tell you how simple this can be, my mother had a lifelong, well, maybe not lifelong, but for much of her life, she, she loved Earl Grey tea with milk, okay? Hot tea with milk. And I tell you, when she moved into memory care, when she was having a bad moment, here she is in Paris, France, of course, uh, when she had a bad moment, the caregivers would say, Dorothy, oh my goodness, you're worried about your son, David. You haven't seen him in, in many weeks. And of course, maybe I was there that morning. Dorothy, how about I pour you a lovely cup of Earl Grey tea with milk just the way you like it? Ah, uh, heaven, she felt like that caregiver, you know me, and therefore I must know you. And she felt this relationship and connection. And you see, again, in, in memory care, you know, my mother was living in, in a residential care community. You see, if my mother liked the staff member, she cooperated more. So sometimes, you know, these little ideas I'm giving you just take a minute or two. And, and they, they kind of build this trust and connection, even when it is your own family member, maybe they're forgetful, they're confused. And you take a minute or two to be a little less task-oriented, a little bit more person-centered, everything goes better. And again, if you're a staff member on this call, you, know, you, you say something to my mother and talk to her for a few minutes, she relaxes, she feels trust, and the shower will go better, um, getting her dressed will go better, everything will go better, okay? Now, this one, of course, we can we can take uh, quite a bit of time on, but I'll at least touch on it because, again, in talking with uh, uh, different friends of mine who uh, you know are involved in the Orthodox community, the Jewish community in general, we certainly know that trauma is very real for many of our family members, notably the Holocaust uh, memories. And, and this is such a tough subject to, to talk about, but I'll, I'll give it my best for a few minutes here. And, and one way I want to frame this for you is by saying that in our brains, our brains are so amazing, right? We're actually kind of programmed to remember happy memories over sad memories. Happy memories over sad memories, with the exception, of course, of trauma. And trauma rears its ugly head, particularly when we think about dementia, where people are somewhat, you know, it's maybe it's a bit of an oversimplification. They're kind of rolling back into time, so to speak. So traumatic memory is, is, is really a challenge and an issue. There's not an easy answer. But I, I wanted to let you know that um, if your family member on top of some you know, terrible memories uh, also is having hallucination, 
uh, either visual sounds or smells, that can be a sign of something called Lewy body dementia, which is probably the second or third leading cause of dementia. Uh, what I wanted to say to you is, you know, the basics I think hold true. Empathy, reassurance, uh, don't argue, don't correct. Um, be comforting, be life affirming, music, time outdoors, religious practice, you know, favorite readings, prayers, all of that can be helpful. You don't wanna say if someone has a hallucination, oh, don't worry mother, there's nobody there. You, you wanna say, mother, tell me what you see. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. It, it sounds like you're so worried, this is terrible. I love you, I'm here for you, you're safe, you're valued. You know, things like this can be very, very helpful, I think, in just providing this reassurance as well. I don't have it on the slide, but I will mention another aspect is think about the environment. You know, uh, I, I dealt with a family member fairly recently where there was a lot of paranoia, a lot of fear, a lot of agitation. Well, her house, her, her apartment was very cluttered, very dark. Um, I think she was actually seeing things and shadows that were contributing to her for bad memories and issues. So, you know, again, think about good lighting. The older eye needs a lot more light than the younger eye, decluttering the space, giving more light. Again, all of these things are some things, but we can come back and talk a bit more about this later. So again, with communication, I'll just mention a few things here. Oops, sorry, go back here. Ah, there we go. Um, sadly, the communication centers of the brain, the language centers of the brain are damaged by many of the dementing illnesses, okay? The, the person with dementia has trouble understanding what I'm saying to her, and she has trouble, I, I may have trouble what she's saying to me. There's actually something called uh, aphasia, primary progressive aphasia, PPA, where uh, people often lose language even before cognition. Uh, but in general, uh, communication is damaged, and what's even worse is because they're so forgetful, even if they understand you, they might forget the very thing you ask them within a minute or two. So here's a few just general tips. <clears throat> Uh, don't ask too many questions. <clears throat> Sometimes caregivers almost try to test the memories. Now, mother, do you know who I am? Or mother, do you remember this? I encourage you not to do that because, you know, the person with dementia, their memory loss is very real. And you see, they often know they should know. So when you, <clears throat> when you ask them questions they don't know, that can add to frustration. <clears throat> pardon, my <clears throat> pardon my raspy voice here. Uh, don't argue <clears throat> or correct. Um, you know, it's very tempting. Sometimes we, we are kind of in old family patterns, but, you know, is it really worth it to try to win an argument with a person with dementia? You know, that memory loss is very real. Uh, you can gently cue them, gently give them some information, but in general, uh, we want to just sort of, you know, kind of go with it. If, if they say President Eisenhower's, you know, doing a good job, you say, Mom, I like Ike too, not what's wrong with you. He's not the president. When you're communicating, um, maybe things aren't going well. Sometimes, you know, the old saying, we just have to fall on the sword. Mom, I'm so sorry. I'm not doing a very good job of this. Maybe you're changing mom's briefs or helping. I apologize. I'll, I'll do better next time, you know. Uh, minimize distractions. You know, again, I know when my mother lived in memory care, uh, we had to kind of position her at the table. So there wasn't a lot of people coming and going because she would sort of be distracted and look at them and then not eat. Smile, practice positive emotional communication. Even as they forget, you know, words and, and connections, I, I think they are looking for a friendly face and they, they retain this emotional memory that you're someone special. Give lots of compliments, you know. Again, uh, dad, you, you're a wonderful teacher. We've learned so much from you. You're, you're the wisest man I know. Uh, how much time does a compliment take? Maybe a minute. How much money does it cost? It's free. And again, it builds self-esteem and connection. <clears throat> uh, offer lots of compliments. Give some simple choices. You don't want to feel like you're bossing the person around. That They're sensitive to that. So, you know, mother, do you want to wear the red sweater today or the blue sweater? And that helps them feel more in control. And one of my fun things I like to do is I, I like to ask for opinions. I might say, you know, um, mom, I, I had this new necktie on. Um, what do you think? Is this a good color on me? Should I keep it? And, and, and asking them for their opinion, is does the soup taste good? Does it have too much salt? Does it need more salt? When you ask somebody their opinion, it means that you value them, which I think is really quite wonderful. A couple more things on communication. People with dementia often say no to almost everything, maybe except ice cream. Uh, and so um, if you want mother to come with you to the garden for a little bit, you know, try three times to turn that no into a yes. Mother, would you like to come to the garden today? Oh no, dear, I'm tired. 
now, mother, I know you love roses and the roses are out. I, I think you'd enjoy seeing them. Oh, I don't think so, dear. Now, mother, take my arm. I, you, you are such an avid gardener. You're, you have that magic touch. Please come. I could use your advice on the roses. Oh, okay. All right. So again, you know, be proactive because often they will say no. Um, if you don't really understand what's happening or maybe they're talking about, you know, maybe their mother who, who's long passed from the world, uh, you know, if she says, where's mother, where's my husband? And, you know, you can say, well, tell me more about him. Uh, you know, re remind me about your childhood. Uh, I want to go home. I want to go home. Tell me more about your home. Uh, did you live in the city or the country? And, you know, again, when you, when, you, when you draw them out, that can sometimes kind of move them off that repetitive questions. I know there was a question of repetitive questions. What time is it? What time is it? What time is it? Tell me more about that doctor's office you went to. I know you're always worried about running late for appointments. You know, do you like the doctor? You know, um, and affirming words. And, and again, we hope we're doing this from our heart, but what would I do without you? It's good to be your friend. All of these things help that person feel safe, secure, and valued. Okay. A few more words on uh, dementia-related behavioral changes. Uh, you know, it's a myth that everybody with Alzheimer's or these other dementias is somehow combative or violent. Uh, certainly they can be because sometimes they may not understand what's happening around them. You know, if I'm, if I'm in my house at night and someone walks in the front door who I don't know, it might scare me. I might, I might get up and punch them if I think someone's trying to hurt me or rob me. Well, maybe it's my brother and I have dementia. I don't recognize him, you see. So sometimes, again, we have to understand that these behaviors really have a root cause. So again, things like refusal to do personal care showers, getting mixed up about dates, times and places, even important ones. For example, thinking that a Tuesday evening is a Friday evening, paranoia, apathy, aggression. A delusion is a fixed false idea, maybe thinking the food is not kosher or you're not doing that well for them, hiding things, hoarding, rearranging household items. So again, these behaviors can be common. Uh, approach them with a sense of calm, with acceptance. Again, my, my example of the migraine where maybe my friend is angry about something I say because again, he's in pain. Um, be creative, look for root causes. Uh, there's often some things you can do to really make a difference as I have on this slide here. <clears throat> Again, look for root causes and triggers. Maybe this person gets kind of agitated and challenged after you've had a really large get together. Perhaps mom is better off in a smaller group. Rule out pain, depression. Is there a new medication they've been on? Uh, all of these things are important. I've already mentioned not labeling or blaming them. I know we're only human, but try not to. Uh, reassure and redirect. Father, can you help with this project? Or mother, I, I could sure use your advice in the soup. Would you help me set the table? Sometimes engaging them in a simple activity can be a way of, of kind of changing some of the behavior. Uh, brainstorm some ideas with your family, with uh, any of your professional uh, network, your physician. Again, Life story work, you know, sometimes you can discover certain things people really love to talk about, they love to do, they love to listen to music that you can actually kind of, you know, pull out to maybe play again mother's favorite music and that will calm her. Uh, develop a common script. I, I want to take a minute on this one, but you know, uh, recently a friend of mine moved his mother into memory care and the siblings were, were not really in agreement, okay? And every sibling would visit mother and, and say something different. Mother, isn't this a wonderful place? You're so lucky to be here. Another sibling might say, mother, I feel so guilty. Please forgive me. Uh, it was a terrible decision. And, and, and one person said, now they're going to sell the house, I'm sure. And, and you all these different things. And what happens is if you're all on a different page, it never helps. So develop a common script around behavior. So if someone's moved into the Jewish home or another place, uh, maybe, maybe the script is mother, I, I'm sorry you're here right now. I know you don't want to be here right now, but you know the, the doctor wants you to be here for now, mother. You need to build your strength, which I think is a very life-affirming, positive, true statement. Almost everybody does need to build their strength. Uh, double down on activities the person enjoys, uh, music, time outdoors, even pet therapy can be very supportive. Okay. Now, I'm sure if we had two or three hours together, I hear lots of stories, but you know, sometimes the best caregivers become the bad guy. And, and it can be so painful. But remember, the person with dementia may not even understand that they're not at their best. They may not realize that they're making poor decisions. They may not realize that there's a problem. 
So you come in and sort of take over, even when you're doing it in their best interest, they might get paranoid or blame you, right? Uh, one family member I know, and I thought this was a brilliant use of what I called NAC, you know, that art of doing difficult things with ease, uh, he would have his father sign the checks and, and approve the invoices. He'd have them all written out for the father because the father could not do it anymore. But he would present the accounts to his father and say, Dad, you know, would you help me? You're so good at this. I have all of your accounts ready for your approval and review and your signature. And he would do that. And, and that, that really knocked down the father's fear that someone was stealing his money. And as I mentioned earlier, the psychotropic drugs can really save the day if someone's having some dangerous or, or truly upsetting, challenging behavior, but they do have side effects, a greater risk of falling down, some cardiac issues. So I like to say the hugs can be better than drugs. Be careful with the psych medicines. Now, again, I've put a lot into this workshop. I hope this is not too much information, but I'm always uh, wanting to do more, more, more. And so I want to just add a little bit, because I, I suspect some of you are dealing with this. How do you talk to your mother or father about their situation? Maybe they're fairly new in their diagnosis. What are some do's and don'ts? Well, again, everybody's different. A friend of mine sat his mother down and really with kind of no holds barred said, mother, the doctor says you have Alzheimer's disease. This is what we need to do. And he said his mother had always been very direct, really a straight shooter. And, and sure enough, she actually appreciated his kind of a sense of authority and, and really laying it out, giving her a little checklist, showing her the brochures, even though mother didn't really read them all. But in most cases, it's not quite that easy. So again, many of your family members are aware of their losses. Uh, I want you to try to tell the truth at first. You know, mother, the reason why we need to have some in-home help is for this reason, or dad, the reason why, you know, I, I need you to, you know, let me help you. Uh, get ready for services or help you with these things is because, you know, you, you, you have some memory problems and, and guess what? A third of the people your age have the same thing, dad. Welcome to the club, but we're going to be here to help. Um, maintaining a sense of optimism. I, I know that can be so hard, but I, I do think that is important. I uh, don't over explain, don't argue. Uh, in most cases, the person with dementia has difficulty processing information, remembering. He also has diminished judgment. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Uh, and I think sometimes appealing to their emotion, you know, Father, I'm so worried about you. The whole family's worried. Please help us. Please work with us because we want you to have a good quality of life. And it's very important for us that, you know, you do these things or stop driving or other things like that. And when the person cannot weigh in on an important matter, matter maybe your family member has dementia this advanced, think about this concept called substituted judgment. Now, my father is no longer really able to make a good decision. What would he want me to do? What would my brother, my father, what, it, what would he or she wanted me to do if they could have, have talked about this 20, 30 years ago? You know, what would they have wanted you to do? And, and so, for example, with residential care, uh, we all want to keep someone at home, but maybe, maybe the person's not sleeping. The, the, the wife is, 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 her health is in danger. She's not getting sleep. Maybe the person's walking out the door at two in the morning and being unsafe. Maybe he's being victimized financially by a neighbor or playing the bogus Canadian lottery or something. You know, what would he have wanted me to do? Would he have wanted me to do nothing? Well, the odds are, if your father could have spoken about that 20 years ago, he would say, protect the family, protect, protect the money I worked so hard to make, protect me, and, and don't let me embarrass myself. You know, act and do some good things. And this, again, can be very, very helpful. So a few more things in my caregiving uh, kit, and then I'm going to try to zoom to the, the questions here. Um, one of my heroes, uh, one of your New Yorkers, Dr. Oliver Sacks, who died a few years ago, brilliant neurologist. He did a lot of beautiful writing about music and dementia, and, and he reminds us that, that music is the language of dementia. It turns out that song lyrics and music actually live in a different part of the brain than words and language. So, so often your family member will remember all the old, even, even uh, religious music and other music, where, where their words and language are failing them. So, so encourage music. And you can even play it during personal care, which will sometimes relax them for the shower or for getting dressed or changing their brief or things like that as well. I've already mentioned exercise. Again, I recommend it twice a day if you can. Uh, also, uh, our time outdoors. You know, um, I think what's really powerful is when you're outdoors, it's, it's spiritual, it's sensory. You can smell flowers, hear birds, uh, Maybe here's some traffic in New York, but nevertheless, 
It offers natural vitamin D and outdoor time does fight depression and it can reduce agitation as well, okay? Purpose, we all have a need to be needed. So involve your family member as much as possible and you know, preparing for Shabbat, cleaning, shop, shopping, cooking, setting the table. Um, you know, anything you can do to give them that sense of purpose is great. And, and, and you know, it's so tough because I'm sure you, you want everything to be perfect, but even if the person cannot do it as well as they used to, do their best, do your best to involve them in the process. If they can't quite do it right, let them go to it, let them do it, let them finish it. And then maybe you or one of your children or grandchildren can come and do like the actual proper cleaning or get everything just ship shape, but, but let them do it, even if it isn't quite to your standards, uh, because that gives them that feelings of accomplishment. And later you can come in and do an extra sweeping or preparation for, for uh, your meal. Uh, meaningful discussions, again, uh, I think sometimes even though memory has, has suffered, uh, discuss life lessons, life lessons, messages, uh, talk about family, family connections, discuss gratitude. I think you can still have a lot of philosophical, indeed religious, spiritual conversations about broader life themes, even if they forget you've talked about something meaningful, important 30 minutes later, 10 minutes later, in the moment they've enjoyed this connection, in the moment they've enjoyed this experience of learning and connection. So as I end my formal presentation, I just thought I would mention um, another one of my heroes, Dr. Tom Kitwood, who was a, a brilliant researcher who, who died much too young in England, uh, did a lot of early work in caregivers. He says, caregivers are physicians of the human spirit. So I wanna thank all of you who are caregivers, and I guess I'll give you an honorary doctorate tonight uh, as, as physicians of the human spirit. Um, I thought I would share with you my own uh, work here. This is the Dignified Life book, my family book that's widely available on Amazon or Kindle, uh, but you're going to be, we'll have a little raffle for some of those copies tonight. I do have a website, Best Friends Approach. I'm on Facebook. Uh, you can just put in the words Best Friends Approach on the Facebook screen, and that's my professional page. And I'm simply at davidtroxel at gmail.com. I, I welcome your emails. I'm always happy to do my best to respond. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, I wanted to say again uh, what an honor it is to be with your wonderful group and your family connections and caring for each other and hope I've given you a few good ideas today. So um, I, I noted a few questions, Leah, or you can start reading them to me and uh, I see 24 of my goodness in the chat, so maybe there are some good questions. Yeah, okay, we're, I don't think we're gonna get to all 24. I'll try to be fast. A rapid round here. <laughs> Not a problem. We'll start with this. Um, I am tw 74 years old and feel that my memory is no longer as good as it was. I am constantly worried about having beginning stage Alzheimer's. What should I do to slow or stop the progression? Okay, well, first of all, thank you for, for being so honest and talking about your own memory. I think a lot of us are worried about our memories. You know, in ancient times, people were illiterate. They probably had amazing memories because they had to remember everything. Today, we just look at you know our phone or you know we don't remember things the way we used to. So um, number one, if you are feeling that your memory is truly disrupting your daily life, uh, I, would, I would absolutely go to your doctor, um, go to a neurologist, get some tests. You might have one of those pseudo dementias like a B12 deficiency or depression or be on the wrong meds. Um, otherwise, honestly, live your life. There's really no medicine that will help. I'm not a fan of these things you see advertised on television that boost your memory. Don't waste your money on those supplements. Um, eat well, exercise, stay socially engaged, volunteer, sing. Um, all of that can be very, very helpful. Um, I'm just going to interject because somebody asked a different question about UTIs. So I'm just going to interject um, that I always say that um, Alzheimer's is generally um, slow growing disease. So when somebody was perfectly with it and tomorrow they suddenly don't know what their name is, there's usually something medical going on, very often a urinary tract infection. And thank you to the person who brought that to our attention. Um, okay. My mother-in-law is a very social person. She lives in an assisted living facility. Um, she is all smiles and sings and is interactive during all activities. Recently, she lost a front tooth. She does not seem to have a problem with it, but we feel that it is embarrassing for her to be seen oh. that. 
think for us it's an eyesore. She also chews and spits out her food in public or in private. So we're wondering, are we supposed to push the issue or should we just let her be content the way she is? Oh my gosh. Okay, well, um, great question. Um, you know, I mentioned that issue of substitute judgment. You know, your mother maybe years ago would have been really horrified to imagine she was walking around with, you know, one less tooth. That being said, you know, if it doesn't bother her, uh, I would encourage you just to kind of take a deep breath and recognize that with dementia, things change. So, um, you know, if there's a way to take her to a dentist, get something fixed without a huge rigmarole, obviously I'd probably do that. But I think some of it may also be in, in just kind of going with a new reality. If your mother's happy and doing well, um, perhaps, you know, it, it, it should be the case that you just, you know, maybe recognize that um, everybody there is, you know, in this world of dementia, their social uh, friends, hopefully will have empathy and understanding. So I would say if it were me, I think I would try to let go of my concerns, however tough it can be. Um, but yes, and then the spitting and other things, I, I guess you might, again, I don't know if they're directly tied to the, to the dental issue, perhaps take her to the dentist and see what you can get done. But, uh, I think that would just be kind of case by case study, but in general, if it isn't bothering them, I, I tend to try to let go a little bit. My mother-in-law was very good friends with my dad who died 14 months ago. She attended the funeral on Zoom and at the time was in early stages of dementia. She asked me frequently how my dad is doing and how he's feeling. Although this is difficult for me, I just keep telling her that he's doing well and getting older. Is this okay or am I supposed to tell her that he is no longer alive? Yeah, you know, I think it's okay. I mean, you know, in general, years ago, we, we would, um, Leia, we would, you know, just tell people, oh, make something up, or just don't tell them, just tell them what they want to hear. And people would say, oh, he's at Walmart, he'll be here back soon, <laughs> you know, and, and it was really seemed inappropriate. And most of us, you know, don't feel comfortable lying to our parents or our family members. But if you're doing it in their own best interest, I think we're forgiven to some extent. So I would say, be as authentic as you, as you can. You know, you could even say, gosh, I, I'm not sure, or, um, you know, he's in a good place <laughs> or, or um, you know, things like that. But, but I, I think just to be kind and say, oh, well, thank you for asking. So may, maybe I would say like, you know, how's your father, David? Well, thank you for asking. Yes, I love my father. You know, uh, do you remember the time that the two of you went golfing and you hit the hole in one? And, and you know, sometimes you can avoid saying he passed away or avoid an outlandish fib or lie. But I think it's okay to be a bit more, um, you know, discreet about that. Yeah. Now, I will give you one example, Leah, that's actually an important one. Uh, a friend of mine, um, I thought it was just a brilliant thing. Her, her, her mother said, well, where's mother? Where's mother? And mother had long passed away. And my friend Anne knew the mother would kind of not let go. So she said, you know, you know, mom, your mother, my grandmother, isn't it something? Mother died seven years ago. And then she paused and said, didn't she make the meth, the best pie? Didn't she make the best pies? Remember her her apple pie? It was the best, wasn't it? Oh yes. And they began talking about pies. So sometimes if you pause and insert a happy memory, uh, a funny memory, you know, something really sweet, that can be very helpful. I saw one question in the margins I can maybe tackle real quickly. Do you tell a person with Alzheimer's about their diagnosis? Most physicians do nowadays. Um, I, I generally do believe in telling people what they have. Um, you know, my mother's doctor said, Dorothy, you know, I, I have to tell you, you've got Alzheimer's disease. Welcome to the memory loss club. A lot of people, you know, are, are going through this and just enjoy every day. You know, you have so many good friends and family, uh, you're going to be okay. And, and she walked out of the doctor's office with a smile. So, yeah. You know, it's very interesting. Um, I once had this conversation with Dr. Galvin, who was, at the time, he was, he's actually in Florida now, but he was the director of the Pearl Barlow Center. And he would not see a patient unless they were agreeable to the fact that he would tell the patient what the diagnosis yes. <clears throat> yes. He would agree that he won't use the word Alzheimer's disease. He would use mild cognitive impairment or memory loss. And I asked him why he did that. And he said to me, he said, Leah, believe it or not, I see relief 
when I tell that patient that they have a diagnosis and there is a doctor in front of them that is going to try to help them, there's a part of every person who has early stage dementia that knows they're off. And all of a sudden there's a medical professional there who's validating what I feel and who is actually gonna try to help me. And he said, I see profound relief. I know the families think that they're sheltering um, the patient by not telling them. He said just the opposite. I see the relief in the patient's faces. So it's just something. And, that and Leah, I have to tell you that, you know, families are afraid that mother would be deeply depressed or other things. And, and, you know, it really doesn't seem to happen that way. I mean, I know every case is different, but in general, um, if you, if you don't tell the person, it's often more about our fears than about their needs. And they often know something's going on. So I, I agree with your sentiment completely. I'll take one question that I saw in the email. Uh, what do I do when my father wants to eat, or sorry, if it was your father, some, my, my, my family member wants to eat all the time, is always hungry and forgets he's eaten. So I think this is very common. Um, what I'd say is smaller portions, little snacks, healthy snacks. Uh, don't say now, dad, you already eat, you already ate. So maybe, maybe see if you can break up some meals during the course of the day. Um, and I would think the other thing you could also do is say, you know, soon, Dad, hey, we're just going to be working on this and, you know, we'll have some meals soon, things like that. So, so don't say no, 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 you haven't, you've already eaten, you just had lunch, dot, dot, you know, try to see if you can be a bit more creative in how you are, are, are doing the, the meals in general. So this question came up in a few different um, ways. So I'm just going to present it the way I've seen it different um, from different questions. Um, when a patient wants to know an answer to something and you've repeated it a couple of times or you think that they know the answer to that question, should you fill in the answer for them or should you make them work hard to try to trigger their memory? Yeah, um, I, you know, it's a bit somewhere in the middle, Leah. You know, I, I don't want you to, you know, kind of disable the person by always that mother, let me help you. No, I'll do that. I'll do that. No, don't do this. I'll do that. You know, uh, I think that we want to try to encourage them to keep up their, their skills the best we can. So if someone's trying to remember, you know, my son, my son, my son, you know, I, I often, I often will give them a little space and see if it pops up. And if not, I might say, oh, you mean David? Oh yes, David. Yeah. So, you know, we do want to protect their dignity, save, save face, that old phrase. So I, I do try, you know, when, when my mother and my mother was still fairly early in her dementia, my father and I would take her to, to dinner, you know, and one time I'd let her order and she ordered like spaghetti and oh my gosh, it ended up over everything. It was just a big disaster. So the next time we went out, you know, I said, oh, mother, I hear the salmon's very good here. Oh yes, darling, I'll have the salmon. <laughs> so, you know, there's little ways we can kind of save face and protect dignity. Um, how do you deal with OCD and dementia constantly asking, did I pray so focused on it? So yeah. um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to just do a little bit of background, Please. David. So Orthodox Jewish men pray three times a day. I think the most common time this happens is by the afternoon prayers, which are basically based on the time of year, because it's around sundown. And that's the most common thing that Orthodox Jewish men will be saying, did I pray the mincha services yet? Because mincha, the afternoon services. And this is a very common thing um, because it's so ingrained in them that they would never miss one of the three prayers. They will have just come back from praying and say, I need to go out and pray. Mm -hmm. and deal with that. <clears throat> yeah, very tough. And see, you can understand, this is obviously a very important thing. It's something they care about tremendously. Uh, they, um, it's a ritual, it's an old routine. So it's not surprising, Leah, to me whatsoever that this could be a common behavioral issue. Like, have I done this? Because they, they, they feel that if they haven't, you know, they, they, they really um, embarrass their family or, or let down their, their faith practices, et cetera. So it's an important deal, obviously. So I guess all I would do is, you know, I'd, I'd be a bit creative and try some different things. You might um, approach that question with humor and say, oh my gosh, Father, Father yes, you, you prayed and, you know, you, you offered a beautiful, you were, you, you had, your words are always so beautiful. You always have the most lovely voice, you know, um, 
I, I think, I think, you know, God is hearing you today, you know, or, or some phrase that you might have to kind of expand to kind of make a bigger imprint, like, yes, you're okay. Um, probably underneath that is anxiety. So again, I would do anything you can to, to you know, kind of address that. Um, you know, I don't know this would work, but you might want to keep a little chart with a little schedule on a calendar, maybe up. Oh, look, Father, let's double check. Oh, you're okay. Oh, look, here we go. One, two, three, three check marks today. Y you are, you are, you are good, Father, you know. So maybe some techniques like that might help. But uh, in general, you can't really argue or correct, but reassure and say, hey, everything's fine. Yes, you're, you're really okay. And maybe maybe kind of add a bit more uh, emotion or intensity. <laughs> you know, I used to greet my mother when I went to memory care sometimes. Mother, how are you? Oh my gosh, it's your son, David. I'm so happy to see you. And sometimes, you know, adding a little bit of almost, you know, kind of fluff or humor or energy, it will sink in more than just a mild remark. And now I'm gonna interject something from the Jewish perspective. I say, if they, if they pray, but seven times or 10 times or 15 times a day, I don't see anything wrong with that personally. And if they repeat their prayers 10 times, that's fine. So if- Yes, well, good point. Excellent, obviously, yes. It. Yeah, yeah. Just do it. Or let's pray together or something like that, yes. Correct. I had an earlier question, Leah, about insulin shots and the finger pokes and how do I get my family member with Alzheimer's to do that? That is a tough one because, you know, sort of like rehab, when you've broken a hip or something, you can say to me, David, you're going to feel some pain, but use it or lose it. And I can understand that. But in, in the moment, they just feel that pain. I, I guess what I would say is, you know, probably your best bet is to develop a little script, you know, blame it on the doctor, or, you know, have a light touch mother. And this will just a little poke here, but it's good for your health, good for your brain. Um, doctor's orders and maybe, maybe redirect her with, you know, the, her favorite treat or some you know, some kind of uh, beverage or something like that, or some music. Um, it is really tough. Maybe check with your doctor. If, if your family member is really refusing the insulin, refusing the finger pokes, maybe check with your doctor, see if they can, you know, go on some other kind of medication or do some other kind of adaptation. Um, what if you're young, under 60, and having liver issues? Could it have been a leftover result from COVID? Could it just be overwhelmed? Um, I'm going to add the next question at the same time. I'm worried about my mother who seems to be forgetting talking about specific things from one day to the other. She's been overly anxious lately. She's been making rash decisions and changes her mind. Are these signs? Should I go to a neurologist? Should I not be concerned? Um, I'll mention one resource. Maybe Yehuda, Yehuda can put it in the uh, chat room, but... Um... The Alzheimer's Association has a, has a, a very popular um, downloadable handout called the 10 Warning Signs of Alzheimer's Disease or 10 Warning Signs of Dementia. And it does break out some of the concerns you might have. In general, what I would say is if their behavior is, um, is, is, is disrupting their regular life, if they're making poor decisions, you know, um, that's when I'm very concerned. Like it's one thing if I forget a name or two or miss an appointment now and then, or you know, accidentally leave the, the stove on. But if lots of different things are happening regularly and I'm making poor decisions, I would definitely go to the neurologist, get a good workup and evaluation, see what's going on. Because again, um, in this particular case, if mother's making rash decisions, you know, you, you would wanna also be able to you know, get in there and make sure that uh, she's not being financially exploited, for example, or, or doing things, you know, decisions that uh, might be uh, unfortunate. Can you talk a little bit about sundowning? Sundowning. It's kind of an old concept of that in the afternoon, um, people often have more agitation. And, um, and I've seen some wild theories that's you know, related to the, to the cycles of the moon or whatever. I, I think, honestly, sundowning, where late in the afternoon, people begin to have some agitation, I think it's because they get fatigued. You know, if you have dementia and you're trying to set the table, you know, you're trying to organize a meal, it's, it's almost exhausting. You're having to work two, three times harder. Um, I, I was actually born in Paris, France. Uh, you know, I, my, I was an Air Force brat. And when I go to France and visit my French friends and my French is really rusty and they're all speaking French, I'm almost exhausted by the end of the evening because I'm trying to focus so hard to listen and speak and understand. 
So I think uh, maybe a, a rest, an afternoon nap, time outdoors, again, maybe doing like a little ritual uh, with them of, of having a favorite beverage or you know something like that that can be very helpful, doing some simple tasks or chores. Those can be good things for, um, for sundowning. What if a person doesn't want to eat anything besides chocolate and cake and otherwise refuse to eat all day? Ah, well, um, many elders have a sweet tooth, no doubt. Uh, I've done some home visits where I found donuts and cookies and candy bars and not much else. Um, oh boy. Well, a couple of thoughts I have is one is, um, you know, there might be some supplements you can get, like some kind of chocolate flavored drink. Um, you know, uh, um, that, that have more vitamins. I don't know if all of those are, are kosher per se, but there might be some things you can do some research on. There are, there of, are, some, that's some good, idea. good fortified beverages uh, that have chocolate, things like that. I would, you know, unless their blood sugar is out of control, I'd probably let them have their sweets, but maybe again, you, you just have a little bit of fun and do some friendly bri bribery. Now, mother, um, I've got a lovely chocolate cake, but you know what? The doctor says we've got to have our soup first or have our salad first or something like that. Um, but yeah, uh, it's, it's tough. And now again, there's a form of dementia called frontal temporal dementia that is the only dementia that affects more men than women, age 55 to 65. If your family member is younger, um, people with frontal temporal often become disinhibited, they have personality change, they get very narcissistic, and they eat a lot of sugar for some reason. They get very into sugar. So again, check with your, your, uh, your neurologist. Is it a good idea to show pictures of family members to help connect and jog memory, or is that considered testing? I love it. I, I think the key is you would say, oh, look here, it's cousin Leah. Oh my goodness, on her 16th birthday. Or maybe you say, now look at Sarah, doesn't she have a pretty dress on? Oh my goodness, you know, is that purple or blue? I can't quite figure that dress out, mother. What do you think? Uh, or maybe it's a very old picture. You know, what do you think? Uh, is this in the taken in the city or the country? So I think I think showing family pictures is great, but I would probably uh, name the person instead of saying who is this. Um, and 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 by the way, if, if if they if they have the wrong answer and they're the wrong relative, you you can gently cue them. I mean I mean you know I think people with dementia and maybe this is a, a good way to begin to wind down today. Uh, more and more, you know, I think people with dementia are, are just like the rest of us. You know, they have all the same needs, emotions, feelings. Um, they have a disease or a disorder that causes this cognitive decline. But, you know, I, I think I've gotten to the point where when I'm with someone with dementia, I know I don't mind, um, you know, some friendly give and take. I had a gentleman with, with a dementia who was a retired judge and he was at our day center years ago. And I, I would joke with him like, you know, judge, I really like you, but I've never forgiven you for the time you threw me in the slammer, you know, and he would laugh and laugh and laugh knowing that he really had, but that was all very good. So again, uh, don't be afraid to try things. You, you'll find out soon enough if it's working or not. How do you approach the topic of the person with dementia, um, of them needing help at home, getting a home health aid, um, or yeah. moving into a child's home? How do you approach that topic? Okay, a couple quick thoughts I have on that about home care. Um, I think I think there are families sometimes who will bring someone in who's more of the housekeeper versus dad, you need a caregiver. So sometimes you can kind of do a little stealth work there. Um, I think sometimes say, dad, I've hired a helper to help me or, you know, helping mom, like let's say your father has dementia, the caregivers are to help mother. So again, that protecting that dignity. Um, I think sometimes, and this is actually a really interesting strategy that worked with my own family. My, my mother and father did not want in-home help and I felt they really needed it. So I actually, I did my research. I found somebody and I kept in touch with her. My mother fell and broke her left wrist. I hired the woman to come in right after. My father was upset with me, but I said, dad, you know, uh, I've already paid her for two weeks. I don't think I can get my money back. No refunds. And, and Rosita started and she never left. She worked for my family for 10 years. So, uh, so have your game plan for in-home help. There will be the inevitable emergency with dementia, the inevitable something or other. And you can often use that as an excuse to get someone in. But I, I, I will say, don't give up. You know, if you try something once, it doesn't work. Wait a few weeks, try again. Sometimes it's, it's, you know, depends on the person. And for sure, coach, you know, like if, if I'm coming in to be someone's caregiver, be sure to give them that top 10 life story card, coach them, 
oh, my father loves it when you agree with him and tell him he's right about everything. And, you know, he, he loves it when you do this. And, and, you know, hopefully that would work out. Um, at what point, if someone has early stage dementia, at what point do, should you start treating him? Um, if someone has the early stages of Alzheimer's disease, it's it generally considered best to, if you're going to put them on Aricept, Exelon, Razdine, Namenda, these, these sort of memory boosters, to try those a bit early. Um, there are families, because they have very few side effects, there are families who leave people on Aricept forever, but um, they've probably done most of their work in 18 months or so. But in general, I would, I would also early on try to devise a plan where they're they're active, where they're exercising, where they're eating well, um, where you know you, you try to keep them as involved in, in life as possible, and I think that can also help them do better longer. Okay, this is a this is a good one. Um, moving a patient with dementia around from home to home versus keeping them in one environment. Again, years ago we thought, oh, don't move them. Years ago, we, we were afraid, but I have to tell you that in my experience over the recent years, you know, people have to do things like maybe, maybe my mother is in a really lovely home here in Sacramento. I take a job in Hawaii. Am I going to leave her behind? You know, I'll take her with me. Right. So um, I would say, do what you need to do, honestly, and, you know, do your best to uh, be reassuring, um, you know, make sure the family again has sort of a common script and plan. Um, you might want to, you know, if she has a red pillowcase in one house, have a red pillowcase in the next house. But, you know, I mean, obviously, it's not a great thing to move someone constantly. But if there's three siblings, for example, and you're sharing the care, um, believe it or not, it sort of works out, you know, and I think, again, um, just be reassuring, give those nice words of comfort and support. Mother, oh, my goodness, it's my turn to have you for the next three or four days. We're going to have so much fun. It's so great to be with you. And sometimes that can help as well. I care for my mom. I work during the day and mom doesn't like to sleep at night. Is there any suggestions of getting an Alzheimer's patient to sleep? Uh, boy, that is so tough. Uh, the sleep cycles are often really disrupted with people with dementia. And, you know, um, when you think about why do people need to make a placement sometimes, it's often because they're not sleeping or because the personal care needs have gotten so great. I guess one thing I'd comment on is try to keep them as busy as you can during the day. Of course, watch caffeine, things like that. If there is a day center or a respite program or some place where they can go during the day to be engaged and active, hopefully that will help them sleep more at night. Uh, talk to your doctor, but the sleep medications don't usually work all that well. But uh, unfortunately, you know, other than keeping them really active and doing your best, it, it can be a challenge. Um, now to go back to the eighth question again, how do you convince the spouse? Like you said about your father, that was a good idea. That was a great idea. You paid for it already. Um, but mm -hmm. very often it's the spouse that feels that it's an invasion of their privacy and do not want to have the aid. My answer really to that when families call me and say, convince my mom that she needs to take in an aid for eight hours or 12 hours or 20 mm -hmm. hours. I really always say at the point where she can't handle it, trust me, she'll ask for it. Mm -hmm. So I do believe in starting small. Yeah. Well, a couple of thoughts I have is, you know, sometimes the adult children become the bad guys with their parents, because even though we mean well, we're, we're getting bossy, we're telling them what to do, we're, we're criticizing. My, my mother and father had a housekeeper, you know, before Rosita ever showed up. And the best I could tell, the housekeeper didn't even know where the vacuum cleaner was. <laughs> she would just come and have tea with my mother all afternoon. And I would complain about it. And my parents were not happy that I would complain. And I finally realized, you know what? They're doing, they're happy. So when I would come to their house, I would do cleaning. You know, ridiculous. But anyway, um, so, so I would say pick your battles as an as adult child. Um, and, you know, if you want something to happen in home care or residential care, I'd mark your calendar to bring it up once a month, something like that. Don't, don't nag them. Don't, don't be overly aggressive. But I guess what I would say is focus on the benefits to the person. So if I'm talking to my father about getting in-home care help for my mother, 
I think it works better to not say, now, dad, you need help. You're floundering. You're not able to care for mother anymore. I would almost say, now, dad, I think mother would benefit from this. Mother would benefit from that. This would be a great gift to give mother and, and, and try that. Uh, it is super tough, though. Um, I will say sometimes it's easier to get forgiveness than permission. And sometimes because you know that you're, you know, your father in this case, the caregiver, he may be exhausted, not making good decisions. Mother has dementia. Sometimes, you know, you, you have to make a decision. My, my poor parents, I hope I, I love my parents, mom and dad, but I'm, I'm telling some family stories. My father was very opposed to grab bars in the shower, you know, because he thought they didn't look good and they would damage the tile. Well, you know, he was in his 80s living by himself after my mother passed away. We had the caregiver during the day. He'd had a couple falls. I went, he went out to a group of friends for the day. I put all the grab bars in. He was really mad at me for about three days. And on day four, he called me and said, you know, you were right. I feel much safer with those grab bars in. So sometimes it is easier to get forgiveness and permission. Forgive me if I'm being a bit disres disrespectful to our wonderful parents. But remember, we also want to keep them safe and sound as well. Okay, I, I think if, if you can just, let's finish off with one, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to consolidate a lot of the questions I've seen here in, in one particular question, which was basically, my mother keeps asking to go to work, even though she's retired for years. And there were a lot of such questions. And, you know, I always tell people who call me, when we talk about dementia care, you have to learn the word, so what? So what? So she wants to go to work. If that protects protect her dignity, if the person feels good about themselves, I think it's just so much, it, you're giving them a gift of allowing them to still think they go to work. Or I know people who have given accountants checks to go through. And I believe you mentioned that before about doing something that the person did in their past and, 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 mm -hmm them feel useful and I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that just before we close about sure. <clears throat> how to pick the battles what's worth fighting over and what is worth and I, if I recall one of the first things I read in your book and I think it was one of the things that had such an unbelievable impact on me and I don't even remember where or how I read it but I remember it was the first time I read your book and you wrote something about if you were asked a question as a child and you came up to the front of the classroom, and I may be saying it all wrong, but it's something to that effect, you will remember it for the, for the rest of your life, that feeling of embarrassment that you had when you were years old, when you're 70, you're still going to remember it. And that's the last thing in the world that you want to do to your loved one, to your parent. So if we can close on this, I'd love if you would speak a little bit about that. Sure. Um, okay. So I guess as we kind of wind down our workshop, I, I guess what I'd like you to think about is a couple of things. Um, you know, it's very hard. It was hard. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty expert in the field. It was hard for me to accept my mother had Alzheimer's. It was hard for me to believe it. It was hard for me to, to pivot. But, you know, Albert Einstein once said, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results, right? So as a caregiver, if your family member has Alzheimer's or dementia, which is a progressive disease that causes this loss of cognition, thinking, memory, judgment, personality changes, if you stay put and just stuck that I'm not going to change, everything's the same, you're going to have a world of hurt because you're not really able to pivot and change as they change. So I, I would say number one, acceptance, you know, uh, if there's family denial, get a letter from the doctor. Uh, there's something called a neuropsychological exam where the neuropsychologist can do a study and give you that idea. But you know, if the doctor writes a letter that you can share with your siblings, mother has Alzheimer's and these are, this is what that means, that can get people on board. Um, so, so as we're thinking about, you know, new ways of doing business, if mother really says, I'm late for work, I'm late for work, I got to go, it, it probably does mean, as you said, Leah, very, very, very smartly that she's feeling this loss of purpose. So I would probably say, mother, tell me more about your work. And maybe I'd reminisce with her about her achievements. Oh, mother, you won the nurse of the year award for three, three years in a row. That's wonderful. And then I'd say, you know, mother, I, I, I think, you know, 
I, I think you're retired now. Isn't that something? You, but you know, mother, I have plenty of work for you to do. Would you help me with my work? And maybe again, give her things to do, productivity, productive things, folding clothes, chores, things like that. Um, and, and, and again, involving them the best they can then be involved uh, in that. You know, Ronald Reagan, I was very honored to have a chance to, to meet President Reagan after his diagnosis with Alzheimer's and work a bit with him and the family. He went to his office every day when he had Alzheimer's as the past president. He, they, he wore a nice suit. He went to his desk. He sat there. They gave him little files to go through, pictures to sign. Um, and they made him feel productive and valued, even though he wasn't really doing real work per se at a certain point. So there may be some rituals or things you could build into your family situation that can give them that experience. Be creative, um, try different things. Don't be afraid to fail. If you try something as a big flop, so what? You know, it, it didn't work out. But, um, but I, I will just make one final pitch. I wanna say thank you to Yehuda and to Sarah from Jewish Home. Um, I, I think activity, engagement, doing things together, planning out some fun things to do around the activities, organizing things around the house, reminiscence, art, music. Um, for those of you who have internet, you know, uh, you know my, my mother showing her pictures of Hong Kong, uh, looking at old pictures of Montreal where she lived and you know, looking at pictures of Paris, France, all of that really creates this lovely day for the person with dementia. Thank you, David. This has truly- Can I just interject? Yeah, Laya, there was one question that I saw over and over, and that was the need for a support group. So I just want to tell everybody that Leia and myself have a support group every month. It typically takes place at 1 p.m. So some people do work and they can attend it. There's always a recording available. But um, if you do want to be added to the email list, because I do advertise it in all, as many local papers as possible, but if you want an emailed invitation, again, please send me an email request to Sarah K, S-A-R-A-K, at M-H-S-L-P, Dot com. I put it in the chat as well, and I'd be happy to add you to the list for future support groups. Somebody did suggest, Leah, and we could talk off afterwards about doing an Instagram live support group, something like that. But I think oh. that there's a lot of opportunity. Um, they're usually hour-long sessions. So um, definitely shoot me an email and I can add you. Thank you, Sarah. And I don't think I've said it enough, but the Alzheimer's Association is, has a tremendous website. Uh, there's also an Alzheimer's Society in Canada. Is Israel has a, an amazing uh, Alzheimer's Society. Uh, I'm a big fan of a group called Alzheimer's Disease International in London. And if you're having issues around combative behavior, around bathing, you know, you know, do your best to go on Google and, and get some fact sheets. I'm sure Sarah and Yehuda would, would print something up for you if you need it mailed to you uh, or, or Leah. But there's a lot of great fact sheets and information available. Um, David, if I can just add, touch on one more thing, because I see there were a lot of questions about this and we just did not even touch that. Um, COVID dementia, <clears throat> have you seen a lot of that? Is it, is it curable? Does it get better with time? What do you know? Mm -hmm. You know, Leah, I don't think we know all the answers to that. I mean, there have been uh, cases with younger people who've had COVID, who have that sort of long haul COVID where they're not feeling as cognitively sharp as they have been. Um, I personally believe that over time there will be recovery for people with long haul COVID who are having cognitive issues. So um, I'm hopeful uh, whether or not it might eventually be a risk factor, you know, like people who've had head injury or concussions are at a greater risk for developing Alzheimer's. Um, that might be the case as well with long haul COVID. I think for people in that situation where you've had some cognitive issues for sure, do your best to, you know, exercise and be socially engaged and do everything you can to, you know, enhance your other risk factors. Okay. We've really, really kept you here a while. And I think mm -hmm. everybody's really enjoyed this presentation and you've taught us a lot. Thank and you. we look forward to meeting with you again. And David's books, like he said before, are available on Amazon. Um, we will be raffling off 10 copies of David's book tonight. Uh, we will go through all the email addresses. You can still send them in and we will send them to David. David will be sending the books directly from California tomorrow. 
Um, and we really, really are very appreciative of this event. And thank you again to the Jewish Home for sponsoring tonight's event. Thank you, David. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Good night, Sarah. Good night, Yehuda. Good night, Leah. Bye. Thank you. Thanks enough.